Good morning, church. God is so good, and I'm hoping you are already at the throne room worshiping him. Let me ask you a question. Do any of you have a family member? Some of you are already smiling. I haven't even asked a question yet, because <laughs> you probably do, right? Any of you have a family member who likes to collect junk? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. I, goodness, y'all, this is street. Karen, you can't be pointing to him like that. Now, of course, they won't call it junk. It's, it's a must-have. To them, it's a must-have. It's, it's not a knick-knack. It's not bric-a-brac or who dazzles and what shits and things. It's, it's I got to have this. This is, this is a needed item, but chances are if you go into their garage or their basement or their storage room, you will see piles of stuff, tools and trinkets. I tell you what, you better not throw that away. <laughs> it might come in handy. You, you never know. Baby, I'm saving that. I'm saving that for that one thing, you know, and just piles of stuff, tools and furniture and lawn equipment. Who knows what else is buried in there? Things that were once sparkly, shiny and new, but now lie rusted and corroded and they're missing parts and knobs and handles. Now hear me, it's on your fix-it list, <laughs> but it might have been on there for a while. You're going to get to it. And maybe soon, and by the way, ladies, while we're talking about that, if a man says he will fix it, he will. There is no need to remind him every six months about it. He is going to get to it. I promise, on behalf of all men, it is on our to-do list. But we just have to find that right piece. We just have to talk to that one more expert. I just have to do a little bit more research. I got one more YouTube video, but something happens, and we never quite get to it. So in that case, it just sits there, and eventually, it's time, as hard as it is, it's time to get rid of it. It's time to let it go. Now, that's what usually happens to broken things. See, today we're talking about brokenness. I'm going somewhere deep with this. Things get broken, and we get rid of them. We purge them from our lives. There is no longer any need for them because they are of no longer a value to us. Hmm. I wonder how God feels about that. See, last week we talked about how hard it is to imagine our ordinary, common lives actually being blessed. How can God take something so ordinary, like bread? How can he make something so common, like our lives, and do something blessed, maybe even sacred and holy? Yet that is exactly what happens to our story when we surrender it to Jesus. That's what it's all about. In fact, to recap last two weeks, if you missed it, to be blessed is to have our identity recovered and restored. It is to become who we were made to be, which is carriers of the glory of God. That is your story. That is your destiny. And this series is about bread that Jesus takes into his hands. He blesses it. He gives thanks for it. Then he breaks it. And then he does something unheard of. He, he shares it. He gives it away. He shares it for the life of the church and for the life of the world. And this week, we're going to look at what happens when things are broken. And we use that word broken here in several ways. When you apply it to your spiritual life, I think of three ways that we deal with brokenness. The first one is the one that describes our frailty. Now, this was the one that you all recognize. This is the experience of running up against that ceiling, our, our, our own limitations, right? Our own finiteness. Like, I just can't do anymore. I, I just, I'm not perfect, and I know it, and I, I'm trying, I'm trying so hard, but I, I just, I have limitations, and I'm frail. This right here is not the brokenness we're going to address in, in depth today. It's these next two. The second one is a brokenness that deals with our failure. Oh, do we have to go there? Yeah, because this one is so important. This is when we come up short, when we miss the mark. This is when we fail to live up to a standard, maybe God's standard, or maybe we fail to live up to a standard we've set, maybe a standard for your relationships, maybe a standard for your family, maybe a standard in work. It's these things that we know we've fallen short in a given situation or a given relationship, and it makes us fully aware of our brokenness. And finally, the last brokenness is dealing with your suffering, living in a fallen world. It's that, that, that fallen nature when we notice that things are broken around us. We see sickness and death, and we see tragedies, and we hear these heartbreaking stories, and it's almost like creation is groaning for God to step in. When is God going to come and make things right? And that's because creation is groaning. All creation is groaning and longing. Lord, when will you come and redeem us? How long, O oh Lord? 
We look around and we see like things are falling apart at the seams. All these are signs of a broken world. And we're going to look at these two kinds of brokenness, which leads us to the big question for us today. What can Jesus do with our brokenness? What can Jesus do with it? Are we doomed? Are we destined to just live as broken people on an island of misfit toys? When bread is broken, it's not long before something happens to it. It begins to lose its freshness. It becomes stale, and it becomes hardened, and no one wants it. Y'all, I had the most awesome sermon <laughs> illustration planned for this. I had my wife go to the store yesterday and buy two awesome loaves of bread. So when we got it home, I opened one in bread. I said, oh, this one needs to be stale because I literally want to take it, and I want to bang it against the pulpit. It's so everybody hears that, doop, doop, doop. you know, it's super hard. Nobody wants it. It's hard stale. But the house was warm. And I was like, the only way we're going to get this bread to harden up quickly is if I set it outside <laughs> in the cold weather. Well, apparently we have some winter squirrels or something, because I go this morning to get my sermon illustrated for you, and it's gone. And like tables are blown over, chairs are everywhere all over the yard, and my bread is gone, this hard thing. Not, yeah, you did. You did tell me not to do that. But I said, baby, I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. This bread will harden. It will be the best sermon illustration. They're going to remember this forever, like the Krispy Kreme sermon. (laughs) But I said, not to worry, because I have a second loaf. And this loaf, I left in the bag. Beautiful, great loaf. And I set it right next to my keys so that it would remind me to go get the bread that's supposed to be waiting for me outside that's hard. So I, I turn around, and I go to my keys, and I'm looking, and that loaf of bread is gone. This was the soft one that I was going to break for you when we could share it and have a good time. And I looked at Amy and I said, where's my other loaf of bread? What have you done? She said, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, you bought two loaves of bread. And we both at the same time look over at the stove and there is this little scrap of bread left. And I said, is that what you served us last night? We ate my sermon illustration? This is, this is horrible. I have, now I have no loaves to share with you. So if you could imagine for a moment this loaf of bread (laughs) right here, and I'm breaking it, and you can smell it, and you see, this is is what happens. See, had that loaf of bread been outside, and the squirrels didn't eat it, or the bears, or whatever we have, it would be hard and stale, which makes me ask the question, what about us humans? When we're broken, do we get stale? Do we get kind of hard-hearted like that bread should have been? It's the weirdest sermon illustration without a bread, but you see what I'm saying? I mean, is this applies to us as humans. Or when we give it to Jesus, does he take our brokenness and do something incredible with it? Let's find out. Open your Bible to Luke 22, verse 19. Luke 22, while you pull that up, let me welcome our online guests and our friends watching from home who are not feeling well. God bless you. I know we have a lot of sickness running around, praying for a speedy recovery for you. If you're a first-time guest, it's awesome to have you with us. Come check us out in person when you're nearby. We'd love to have you. All right, I'm going to read from Luke 22, but I love to set the context for what we read so we don't take things out of context. This is toward the end of Jesus' life, like we're talking hours. He's in the upper room, and he's taking the Passover feast, which commemorates God's rescue of Israel from Egypt and also reveals how God dealt with sin and evil. So Jesus is with his disciples, and he is about to have one last meal with them. And he says this verse. Look with me, Luke twenty two nineteen. 19. So Jesus took the bread, right, and he gave thanks for it. Then he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, this is the second time we've seen in Luke where Jesus takes bread into his hands. The second time that he breaks it, and then he gives it. So let's talk about that first type of brokenness we talked about, the brokenness of failure. See, unlike the gods of other religions in the ancient world that we talked about a couple weeks ago, Israel's God was different. Remember, he is the one true God, the Yahweh Elohim. He provides a sacrifice specifically for the removal of guilt. And he does this in a really dramatic way. Sin is dealt with in Israel. It comes to a worship service on one day of the year known as the Day of Atonement. Anyone know the Hebrew words for it? Fantastic. Yes, Yom Kippur when the high priest will actually go, and he does several things on this day, but one of the things he does after he cleanses himself, he selects two goats. And on one of them, he takes and puts his hands on it, and in doing so, he imparts 
the sins of the nation onto this goat. And then he leads this goat out into the wilderness and turns it loose. Do you see what's happening? That's where we get the term scapegoat, by the way. It goes all the way back to that. The high priest is actually placing the blame, okay, not the forgiveness. Don't, don't miss this yet. Notice what's happening. He places his hands and he imparts the sins of the nation onto the goat and gives it the blame, and it's led away. It's a beautiful picture of God removing guilt from his people. But the second goat has a different fate. The second goat is sacrificed. And the blood is taken into the Holy of Holies behind the curtain and is sprinkled seven times on the lid of the mercy seat right there by the high priest. We know his name now, Harrison Ford. We figured it out. And he sprinkles this. And this is totally different. This is not about the blame. This is the goat now has taken the punishment. God has poured out his punishment on this. It's a picture of God allowing the people to be spared judgment. And it's very elaborate, highly symbolic, and it's beautiful, and it's found exclusive to the Israelite religion. No other false religion had that in this day. Their God was the only God, the one true God, who provided a way to deal with sin, guilt, and shame. Now, here's the cool part. A lot of people miss this. All this stuff about goats and priests and temples and blood and the sacrifices, this is just a foreshadowing of what would come. The blood of goats and rams and bulls would never fully suffice until it was prophesied hundreds of years into the future there would come a true high priest an amazing high priest who would actually do the unthinkable he would become the sacrifice he would write himself into the story in fact he would actually become the temple as you'll see in revelation he would be so great that he sums up in himself all three main components of the old israelite religion and in doing so, he ends the sacrifice system as it was. He is the completion, the culmination, the fulfillment of it. And his name is Yeshua, Jesus. He comes, and in one fell swoop, he becomes the great high priest. He becomes the perfect sacrifice. He becomes the true temple. Y'all, that is awesome news for you. That is fantastic. If you're a fan of the Mandalorian, I have spoken right there. That is the truth that you need to take with you. Jesus becomes all of it. And the writer of Hebrews is so excited that all these symbols come together in, the, in this Israelite worship, come together in Jesus, he can hardly contain himself. And like any good preacher, he goes to asking questions that no one answers. He goes to asking questions that no one asks, like rhetorical questions like this. He says, if the blood of goats and bulls and sprinkled ashes of cows made spiritually contaminated people suddenly holy and clean, how much more will the blood of Jesus wash our consciences clean from these dead works in order to serve the living God? Jesus fulfills everything. No more goats, no more bulls, no more rams, no more blood like that. Sin is finally dealt with once and for all. Now, here's the cool part. Check this out. Once this happened, it makes sense what an old prayer used to, used to resonate in number six, where the high priest in Israel would say over the people of God, he would say, the Lord bless you, and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Y'all want to hear something amazing? I realized it just this week. Some good news in a, in a broken world. Everything right here in that verse, because of Jesus, every word of that is now true if you know Jesus. Every word of that. No longer is this a petition. Think about This is a proclamation. Think of what just happened because of Jesus and how he covers our sin and our brokenness. I'm going to read it again. With that in mind, listen to this verse as it's proclaimed over you right here in 2019. The Lord blesses you. The Lord keeps you. The Lord is smiling at you. Think about that. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more today. Nothing. And nothing you can do can make him love you less. Somebody needs to hear that today. He is your loving, heavenly Father, and He truly loves you. He is smiling at you. The Lord has turned toward you, and He gives you peace. Isn't that incredible? To sum it up, Jesus takes our brokenness, the brokenness because of sin, and He blesses us with peace. I mean, be honest, isn't that what you want? When you go home, when you're with your family, when it's just you, don't you want your heart to resonate with peace, to feel him smiling on you, 
to feel his favor, to feel the Lord's good pleasure. That's what I want. Is there anyone here old enough besides me to remember the movie Chariots of Fire? Anybody remember that? Yeah, the, do, 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 the slow motion run before Baywatch. Da, 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 right? You got this great thing. Eric Liddell is this great runner, and he says this. He says, I believe that God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. There he is doing what he was made to do. He was fulfilling his purpose. And he feels God's peace, his pleasure. That's what happened when Jesus became the high priest, and he took everything on himself. So Jesus dealt with our brokenness, but pastor, I got to ask you, I look around, and I still see a really broken world. So what about the brokenness in the world? How does Jesus deal with that? And what if the pain I feel, what if our lives are broken because we feel it simply because we live in a fallen, broken world? All right, let's talk about the second kind of brokenness, the brokenness of living in a hurting, fallen world. Probably one of the most powerful examples I can find in the Bible comes from John chapter 11, where one of Jesus' dear friends has unexpectedly died, and the people are devastated. And if you read between the lines, you're going to see here in a second, the people, say, they don't say it overtly, but some of them kind of give you the hint that they're miffed at Jesus, like he probably could have prevented this. And they show up. This is one of the darkest moments of brokenness where Jesus himself actually weeps. Look at it with me, starting in verse 17. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was a little, more than, a little less than two miles from Jerusalem. Many Jews had already come to comfort Martha and Mary after their brother's death. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, while Mary remained in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now, be honest, that's a bold statement. That's a bold statement to say to Jesus. After their brother Lazarus' death, the question that Mary and Martha asked is the same question, if you're honest, that haunts us when we have tragedy. It's the same question that haunts us every time we experience suffering. Lord, if you cared, that's what she's saying. That's what she's getting at. If you really cared, you would have done something about this. I know you can. I know you're able. You just chose not to. And I don't know why. That's brokenness. That hurts. Here we are, we're looking at it. See, we, we feel this way. Every time we have tragedy come in our lives, every time we experience pain and it's disconnected from justice, we think this is wrong. Something is wrong about this. Every time we experience suffering that's not the result of guilt, suffering that's not the result of anything we've done, we think, where is the justice in this world? Why is there such brokenness? God, couldn't you have prevented this? When a person suffers needlessly, when a person suffers what we think is random or worse, unjust, we're just like that. We appeal to God. We say, just in the scripture, how long, O oh Lord, are the righteous going to suffer? Or in the case of Lazarus right here, so look how much Jesus loved him. And then if you read on, he goes, wait a minute, isn't this the guy who healed this man who was blind and did this and that? Surely he could have stopped this brokenness. Surely he could. He loved his friend so much, he's weeping. So why did he die? Because it doesn't make sense. Lazarus wasn't an enemy. Lazarus isn't a bad guy. He didn't live in a wicked lifestyle. This had to have been the question Mary and Martha wondered. Is there no justice in the world? Is there no compassion from God? Ever felt that way? Ever been there? I mean, look, if we're honest, what we often hope for from God, be honest, is prevention of our pain. Think about that. What we often hope for from God is to, pre, to, to prevent this. We, we want to be spared pain, don't we? I don't want to go through pain. We don't want to go through that. I don't want to be hurt or bruised or battered or broken. I don't want to experience the pain of a groaning world. Jesus, even you taught us to pray that we would be spared this great day of trouble and trial and testing. So how about start now? Wouldn't that be great? But for reasons far beyond our grasp, get this. God chooses not to major in prevention Instead, he focuses on redemption. Y'all, this is worlds apart. And this is biblical Christianity 400 level. 
This isn't your old fluffy 101 series. This is so deep. Despite what we might prefer, God evidently opts for something he must know. In his infinite wisdom, something is stronger than prevention. And that is what we call redemption. And it takes your mind to wrap around this. See, right here in this Lazarus story, look closely. While we often call what Lazarus experienced a resurrection, if you look closer, that's not really quite right. Wait, what? I thought he was raised from the dead. He was. But look closer what happened. This is more accurately should be described as a resuscitation because Lazarus was not raised the same way Jesus would be raised. And my, we don't think about that. Lazarus was not raised with a perfected, glorified body. He was raised to die again. He died a second. Think about this. Jesus was raised with incorruptible flesh, a body that was glorified and fully perfect in this time. But Lazarus was not. Lazarus was resuscitated. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure Lazarus was thrilled to experience that. He was glad to be back. But resurrection is what awaits us at the end for those who are in Christ. This resuscitation that Lazarus experienced was just a shadow of the real resurrection to come. It was a clue hinting at what God is about to do for all who know him at the end of our life. He shattered the brokenness in this world. See, this resuscitation, this limited resurrection he gives Lazarus, this was kind of tiptoeing around death. Resurrection doesn't do that, y'all. What we have to look forward to, resurrection doesn't tiptoe around death. It breaks death's power completely. This is huge for us. Resurrection is the reversal, the undoing of death. That's the power of redemption. Just as resurrection is stronger than death, so redemption is better than prevention. And we don't like to hear that. Because that means there's still going to be some pain, Pastor. It means my, my heart's still going to hurt. Let me show you what I mean in the real world terms. Imagine you're an artist. Let's say you've worked hard for weeks, and you're painting this masterpiece. And you're working on the walls and this mural, and you're going to put this in a public place on a building where everybody and anybody can go by and make comments about it. In fact, against the wishes of people who know better, they say, you should put up cones, you should put up caution tape, you should put up scaffolding to stop people from getting close to it. But you say, you know what? No. I'm going to leave this like this. I am not, even though I could prevent this work from being vandalized, you say, see, it's one kind of strength to say, I'm, I'm going to stop this from happening. But you see a deeper strength. You say, you know what? Whatever you do to this piece, whatever you scribble on it, however you damage it or deface it, I will find a way to make it even more beautiful than it was before. Well, that's a whole different level of strength. Imagine you're a chess player. You're playing chess, and you are totally unafraid of the opponent's strategy. It's a certain kind of genius for the chess player to block the moves of your opponent, you know, when he moves one, you, you block it. But it is a whole different level of brilliance altogether to say, you know what, whatever your move, I'm still going to put you in checkmate. See the difference? This is so much deeper than we think. It's one kind of power to say, you shall not harm me. I will not let you harm me. It is a whole different level of power to say, do your worst. I will still prevail. That's what Jesus did. He took our sin. No matter how dark your day gets, no matter how bleak these 70, 80, 90, 100 years God gives us, it is a blip on the radar to eternity with the Lord. It is, it is a blip. See, on the cross, Jesus absorbed the full weight of evil and the judgment of God against it. He drained the venom from the serpent. He drank the poison. His death simultaneously paid sin's wage and also canceled God's judgment. His verdict was heaped on him. And on that third day, the Father raised him up from the dead. Now, because of his resurrection, one day our death will be swallowed up in victory. And we will experience that. Only God can do something like that. Only God can take what looked like a bruised and broken and battered flesh on the cross and turn it into something incredible. Only God can take brokenness and make blessedness out of it and make the enemy scratch his head and say, how is this possible? We had him. We stamped out the seed. We had him. Now there's blessedness. Only God can do that and take it and make it something beautiful through brokenness and give us hope. Whether the brokenness is from our frailty or our failure, 
or our fallenness, we are still God's image bearers. You are still made with a purpose. We are still in God's world that he created and that he is ultimately going to bless and make things right. Never forget this. The sin and suffering that God doesn't prevent is not beyond his ability to redeem. That's good. I, I should have made that a point to write that. You need to write that down. The sin and suffering that God doesn't prevent, that doesn't mean it's beyond his ability to redeem it and do something that you can't fathom. What God has blessed, he will redeem, and he calls you blessed. He has the power to make blessing come to pass, even against the infection of evil. God the creator blesses, and God the redeemer will carry you the blessing to its completion. We have his promise, through the brokenness that comes. Glenn Packiam, the guy who wrote this book called Blessed, Broken, and Given, where we got the sermon title from, his whole point is this. God's redemption makes even the broken become blessed. And he does this by becoming broken. No other God does this. He becomes the brokenness. Are you ready for your truth grenade? This is powerful. In fact, go ahead and get your pens out. Get your cameras out. You're going to want to take a picture of this. This, I'm going to write it out so you can take this with you. In Jesus, the blessed God becomes the broken human so that broken humans might become God-blessed. Wrap your head around that. In Jesus, the blessed God becomes the broken human. Who does this? So that broken humans like you and I can become blessed by God. And that's good. When you're broken, something happens and you are uniquely softened and you are opened up to the grace of God. You may not like it, but you are in a whole new ballgame. That brokenness, when it is in Jesus' hands, becomes openness. And that openness allows God's grace to come. It allows you to comfort others. It allows you to speak with wisdom to struggles that no one else can. And that grace is what puts us back together. And the goal is for us to be mature, to let God's grace redeem us, to restore us and repair us. Anytime I hear the word brokenness, I go back to the 1500s, to that awesome Japanese art form called kintsugi. If you've been here for years, you may have heard me mention this, but if not, I'll, I'll highlight it for you so you can do it. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and have our instrumentalists come up now, and we're going to end a little differently as I share this story. This is from 1500 feudal Japan, and kintsugi is this art in which broken ceramic pieces are sealed together. Things that were once redeemed and thought to be eh, kind of worthless now have a new life. Instead of hiding the cracks of where it was broken, these cracks are now highlighted. And then, to make it even more beautiful, these are filled in with pure gold. And they're traced over. And guess what happens when this, this, it is gorgeous. These valuable ceramic pieces that were once broken, see where I'm going with this, are now, instead of being thrown away, now being put back together, and they are worth more than they were. The beauty that comes from this, instead of trying to hide the brokenness, they highlight these cracks with gold, and the value goes up. In fact, people are even being accused of taking perfectly good pottery that's worth a lot and accidentally destroying it so they can put it back together and paint it with gold only to make more money off of selling it because they know that once was broken and now has been repaired is more valuable. Now, this is what God does for us. Every one of us are broken people. We all have cracks, and we try to hide them. It's our instinct, man. I get it. But God says, you know what? Those very cracks, those things that you want to hide, those things that you are most ashamed of, that stuff, that secret that you wish nobody would ever know, that part of you in your past that you try as you might wish was not part of your past, if you let me, if you give this to me, I will turn this, your brokenness, into something more amazing. If you let me, those things that you wish weren't true about you, those things that you wish to keep in the dark, it could be an opportunity for me to turn it into something beautiful, more valuable than before. Because Jesus showed the way. We're all broken, but through Jesus, we're made whole. And here's why. Because God doesn't work around our brokenness. God works through it. That changes everything. You don't have to be ashamed of your failures. We confess them. We say, God, can you, here's my mess. Can you do something with this? I just, I can't. I've tried. I've struggled. 
and I'm falling short. Will you take my mess? Maybe that's you today. Maybe God is speaking to your heart. You're thinking, man, I, I need your grace. I need you to put this broken life back together. Maybe you're listening online. You think there's brokenness all over my life. I'm a failure. I'm falling. Great. You are right where God wants you to experience his forgiveness. But you have to repent. You come to him with your brokenness. He will not force himself. You come and say, God, today I give you my brokenness. Thank you for not leaving me broken in my sin. Thank you for offering a way to restore me, to redeem me. Grace is what holds us together. Will you let him take your broken life today? If you never have, today can be your day where your failure, your fallenness is redeemed. Let's pray about it. Would you bow with me? God, in these next few moments, would you continue to minister to your people? Holy Spirit, speak. For those who don't know you, Lord, I pray that they would invite you into their world today. As we confess our brokenness, we confess our sin, we confess our falling short of your glory. We need you. Only you were the true high priest that can pay the sin debt that we owed. We're so grateful, Lord. We love you. Thank you for allowing your beautiful, perfect flesh to be bruised and battered for me. I accept it. I accept your substitutionary atonement. You are so good. Your love is so deep, so vast. Lord, for those of us who have known you for years, God, I pray that we would bring our, our brokenness, we'd lay it before you at this altar. Would you make something new? You are the potter. We're the clay. And we pray that you would put us together in a way that advances your kingdom, that has meaning and purpose. Speak to us today. In Jesus' name we can pray. Amen. Amen. What we like to do is we finish with one last song. You'll see the altar is open. People will come and pray. I'm happy to pray with you if you ever have a prayer request. Maybe you have a family member who's broken and you need to intercede for them. There's something awesome and powerful about kneeling before the Lord. Maybe you want to make where you are an altar. That's great too. You can stand and sing and just worship God. It's the highlight of our week. Just be obedient to whatever God's asking you to do. That's it. So let's stand together. The words will be on the screen. The altar is open. You come as the Lord leads.